O aki a kahi ko lua mea, o papa, o papa na moku kawai ne, hanau tai tiku tai timo, hanau kia papa dui, hanau kia papa ladi, hanau hawai i kamo kama kahi a po kei ki makahi a po alau. Oh, oh, a ke la o kane, o papa o wale ni u kawai ne, o o kau a papa i te motu o i lole a maui, a nau maui lo he motu i ha nau ia he a lo lani he u, i lani u, i lani he i kapala mae wa. E nui morolani no ku, no lo no no kane maro o kana lo lo wa. Hanau kapuki kua koko ka ahe ya papa kana lo ahe motu i hanau e ahe punu ahe nai ahe keike i ena papa i hanau. Ha a lele papa ho i tahiti, ho i a tahiti, ka papa kawa mo, hi o wakea mo, hi a kalau wahine. Ha a nao la nai ka ula he makahi apu na i a wahine. Ho i a i o wakea loa a hina loa a hina he wahine mo e na wakea. Apa hina ya molo kai he motu, o molo kai ya hina i keiki motu. A hina ke kole o lau ka ula ua mo, i o wake i kawai ne. Oho e, na kalani kuka hali o papa ho i mai papa mai loko i taiti. I nai nā riri ka puna rua hai manova o ke kani o wakea. Mō i a lua he kani ho i a hānau o ahu, o ahu a lua he keiki motu, he keiki makana lau nā rua. Ho i ho aku no mō i me wakea nā ku papata i loli. Ho o hapu u papa i ta motu o kawai. Hanau kama vai lua lani motu He 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 ni i hau he pale no le hua he pani no gaula Oho ta motu papapa na papa ka hukua ke eo lono o ka haku lono ka pumai eo lani o ka puha awa Oho lani o ka puha awa o ka hai mba kana na ke kamalua haku o ka ponia na ie I ta i kapu i o ka poni ala mea poni hiva poni uli poni ele ka poni ka poni ka poni poni ka ua. O papa, o papa, o hoku ka lani ka lani o hoku ka lani. He lani ho wa 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 ka ni ho ni ho i ni hi a i ko li a i pipa i a ka la wa lahi lahi. O wa ke a ka maka o ha lo a ka hi o na o pi i mai o wai lo a o ka ka hi li. No ho no no ho kawe kapuwe o wali kapuwe o makalulu i loha i ke kaha i ta lupe o nalani kapu i apikina i hui a la ho a tawo hi kahi e o ahukai o la a o la a o la a Amai tai tike ari i O ahukini ala a O kukono ala a O lauli ala amaku A o na pukolo ala amai tai tie He mauhi apu kapu no la a Ho o kahi no kala i hana wai Poha mai ke ewe kanalo ina ina 
ahulu mai kapiko kapiko ali i kapiko piko i loko ka veve ali i ke eve o kalani o ka i kapua manui ya o ka i liuhula i i ula i ya i maha maha o o ke kapu o ka unui o kane hola ni ke la o i po wai o hola ni ke i ya o ka ehe ku manawa i kapilina ake I loko ke ke ena au manawa ke ina i oho i mama ke ina huina e vehe kanaki kapula na lula na waiali i o kau wakahi kua ana wakani wahini a iwi kawa kawa ino loa oho i o kani ka ua iwi lani. I kanalo haki ka kala haki kua lua I hale hale a papo i na hua ali I na hua lume lume i ka hohono Lume i ka alihi loa i ka alihi lani O li loa ka ike lani i paka alana Ka oha lani oha kau Tapua kea i waho, o tapu kani nana i tawai a umi. He keha i ano umi i ka lohe lohe lani, ka lohe lohe maka maka o mako. O maka kau ali i ali i lani, o kama wai lua lani, o ka uina kea o ka pangani. Pai kawa ana lulu o ka alawai o hina kulu ina o ta o liko o liko liko mu o otlani ta ho ha mahia loa aku awa ka kawali i o tameha mea ku ko hai i kawaluna kaniope kaniope nana i hakawili I luu luu kau mahi i te kapu No luu luu mahi i hakao i haka i luna o Hawaii I Hawaii i nui a kea Hawaii i ka piko o ke kanaka Hawaii i o ka mole o ka honua E ola, e ola, e ola mau i ta pai moku o Hawaii Mai ka ehu o ka wana au i ka hikina i ke kokolo ana ka la i komohana Ka mole o le hua A i ke la ma moku i ka ili la o papahana moku o ka waine E yo ke au puni o Hawaii e ola mau no E ola mau. Hawaii pono i nana i komo i kalani ali i ke ali i Makua lani e kamehameha e Nao kawa e pale me ka i he Makua lani e kamehameha Nakawa e pole me ka i he Mahalo kamana o, mahalo Amy, everybody please be seated. I want to start by saying my mahalo to both of you and also some mahalos to uh, Native Hawaiian Student Services for putting to together today's event, along with Upena Productions, Kanayo Kana, and of course the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics for putting together this third symposium. <clears throat> my name is 
Dr. Kalabai Amor. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics. And it is my pleasure and honor to welcome all of you here today and to open up this symposium with a few brief remarks. First, about the existence and history of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics. Second, about the state of scholarship and politics today on the Hawaiian Kingdom and Hawaii. And third, a little background that sets the scene for the scholarship you're going to hear and respond to today concerning the continued U.S. military occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the matter of war crimes being committed here. Regarding the existence and history of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, I want to start by remembering and memorializing Stephen Laudig, our first editor-in-chief of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, who passed away recently in June of 2022. Steve was a retired lawyer who moved here in 2000 from Indiana, enrolled in the political science master's degree program here at UH Manoa, where he met fellow graduate student at the time, Keanu Sai. So Steve was exposed to Keanu's presentations and arguments on the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom State. And like many of us who were grad students at that time, Steve was stunned at what Keanu was presenting. Steve knew enough to see that there was merit in exploring deeper the dynamics of our still existing Hawaiian Kingdom state. Steve fell in with a group of graduate students who together became the founding members of the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics in 2003. Understanding the facts of the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom state, Steve then lent his analytical skills and training in legal work towards supporting the efforts of the Regency in its strategic plan to educate further the national population on the facts surrounding the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom state. One of Steve's roles was helping to establish and becoming the first editor-in-chief of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics in 2004. Steve edited that inaugural volume and the second volume in 2006, and he was the opening speaker at the journal's first symposium held at the Emin International Conference Center in April 2005. Steve Laudig, was a loyal supporter and active participant in the work to educate on the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom state. Steve was a dear friend to all of us in the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics and was always ready to help anyone who approached him on thinking through legal matters, on editing or thinking through scholarly arguments, and he was always quick to accentuate any lazy or flippant assumptions that might roll out of your mouth, shooting a rhetorical question at you with a wry smile. I want to also take a moment <clears throat> to memorialize and celebrate briefly the life of the first faculty advisor for the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics and another driving force behind the creation of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, Professor and Dr. George Terry Kanalu Young. Kanalu, as we knew him, was an advanced human being when it came to handling the emotions that arise when one first encounters and comes to understand the implications of the existence of our country. He was an important mentor to all of us in the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics, and his article in the second volume of the journal, entitled Kuleana, Toward a Historiography of Hawaiian National Consciousness, reflected the kind of shift in thinking that was underway that was difficult for many scholars here at UH Manoa to grasp, who, like myself at that time, were heavily embedded in an indigenous and anti-colonial theory mindset and thinking that was at the core of our personal, political, and professional identities. In his article, Kanalu apprised all of us that we have a kuleana, an ancestrally-based responsibility to understand, research, and write about the institutions, values, and systems created by our kupuna, our ancestors, through the changes of the 19th century in their proper context toward the rebuilding of a Hawaiian national consciousness by applying state theory. According to Kanalu, we have a kuleana of scholarship toward a Hawaiian national historiography that in his words was to involve a sources-centered study of kingdom law, governance, and politics. You can and should read further Kanalu's excellent article, my tribute to him, and some of the best scholarly compositions on and related to our Hawaiian Kingdom state in the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics. Being the first victim of US imperialism that carried out regime change, the Hawaiian Kingdom has become the longest running military occupation at 130 years. 
The objective for the U.S. was to secure the islands as a military outpost, which today is the headquarters for the U.S. Indo-Pacific Combatant Command with Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force bases established throughout the islands. When the United States unlawfully overthrew the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom on January 17, 1893, and replaced it with their puppet regime, calling themselves the Provisional Government, the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state continued to exist as a subject of international law. Five years later, during the Spanish-American War, the United States unilaterally annexed the Hawaiian Islands, justifying it as a military necessity, and began to impose American laws and administrative measures not only in violation of international law, but to conceal the occupation. This led to a formal policy of denationalization through Americanization in 1906 that effectively erased all national consciousness and characteristics in the minds of school children. Within three generations, Hawaiian national consciousness and the Hawaiian language were obliterated and replaced by an American national consciousness and the English language. Along with replacing the national consciousness, the United States replaced the Hawaiian political economy with the American political economy that benefited its own nationals. The Hawaiian Kingdom was a mixed economy similar to the Nordic countries. What the United States has done was what Germany did in the occupied states during the Second World War. Count three of war crimes brought at that time was called the Germanization of occupied territories in the Nuremberg indictment and stated, quote, in certain occupied territories purportedly annexed to Germany, the defendants methodically and pursuant to plan endeavored to assimilate those territories politically, culturally, socially, and economically into the German Reich. The defendants endeavored to obliterate the former national character of these territories. In pursuance of these plans and endeavors, the defendants introduced thousands of German colonists. This plan included economic domination, physical conquest, installation of puppet governments, purported de jure annexation, and enforced conscription into the German armed forces." End quote. Where the German occupation only lasted the duration of the war, the American occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom has lasted 130 years and continues. American national consciousness has been so deeply embedded in the minds of Hawaiian subjects that they have unknowingly maintained the American occupation along with Americans who are also led to believe that Hawaii is the 50th state of the American Union. This belief was shattered in 1999 when the Permanent Court of Arbitration, Larson v. Hawaiian Kingdom, acknowledged that the Hawaiian continu Kingdom continues to exist as a state under international law. Since then, a concerted effort by the restored government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, the Council of Regency, embarked on exposing the prolonged occupation and to secure evidence by its Royal Commission of Inquiry of war crimes being committed to hold individuals accountable and to compel compliance with international humanitarian law and the law of occupation. Because of the American occupation, experts in this field are limited, but they do exist here and in Europe. They are comprised of academic and legal experts who have published their research in the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, which is the only academic journal operating in the Hawaiian Kingdom. All other academic journals in the islands are operating behind the facade of the United States and the state of Hawaii. Today we are here to showcase the Royal Commission of Inquiry investigating war crimes and human rights violations committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom. Listen intently, bring forward your questions at the question panel, uh, during today's uh, symposium, and um, let's have fun learning. I want to briefly introduce our first speaker, who is unable to make it here today in person, but is committed to being a part of today's symposium and the important work of educating about our Hawaiian kingdom, Jason Scott Lee. Jason Scott Lee is going to speak to this work and his latest film, the Wind and the Reckoning. My kako. My name is Jason Scott Lee, and I am a Hawaiian actor. Some of you may remember a few of the movies I've acted in, such as Dragging the Bruce Lee Story, The Jungle Book, Rapa Nui or Mulan. 
My most recent film was The Wind and the Reckoning, where I played Kalua i Ko'olau. The film is set in 1893 after the illegal overthrow of the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, where the insurgents, calling themselves the Provisional Government, try to capture Ko'olau and send him to Kalau Papa after he contracted leprosy. Like many of you growing up in Hawaii, I didn't know the true history of our country until the 1990s after meeting Dr. Keanu Tsai. As we now know, denationalization, called Americanization, had a devastating effect on Hawaiian subjects, like me, and our national consciousness since it was formally implemented as a policy in 1906. My great-grandparents were born in the Hawaiian Kingdom in the 1880s, and their national consciousness was very different. They knew their country. I didn't. But now we are beginning to know. I'm here to introduce the trailer for the award-winning documentary by Ben Cohn, titled The Acting Hawaiian Council of Regency, Exposing the American Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Since 1997, the Council of Regency has been exposing the American military occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom through education at the university, international and national courts, government forums, and public presentations. Today we are here to showcase the Royal Commission of Inquiry, investigating war crimes and human rights violations committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom with legal experts from here and Europe, with renowned Hawaiian musicians and entertainers. We also are here to celebrate the story of our country's perseverance and its continued existence despite over a century of occupation. Our late Queen Lili Wu Kolani urged us to onipa, to stand firm, and we have Aloha Aina, Love of Country. So how does a country become a part of another country? Well, for one, you need a government there to enter into a treaty transferring Hawaii to the United States. We don't have that. The United States overthrew our government. So instead, what the United States did in 1898 was instead of acquiring Hawaii legally by a treaty, they passed a law called a Joint Resolution of Annexation, an agreement between the House and the Senate, which was then signed into law by President McKinley in 1898. The United States could no more annex Hawaii, a country, by passing a law than it could pass a law today annexing France. That's why we've been occupied. For the first time ever, the legal question of whether or not Hawaii has a right to assert national independence is now being considered at the highest court in America. So for the last 20 years, Keanu and I and my brother Umi have been, this is what we've been doing. This is, this is pretty much, this is not our job. It's kind of our life. Uh, and we've turned it into a job. Um, because before so, no so one we've would listen to us. So we've now started the program. So Kaui's gonna start. <laughs> Because I'm like, uh, I gotta, <laughs> but hey, it, it works, it works, it's good. So, you know, I'm older than him, you know, so. <laughs> No, but in six months, we're the same age, and then she gets older again. <laughs> I can say that I have not had one instance in court where there's been any opposition to either the factual, the legal, or historical arguments that we made concerning the legal status of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The United States of America could have entered the Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom case, brought their argument for why Hawaii is the 50th state and not an occupied country, and that proceeding would have never happened. For whatever reason, America chose not to do that. Rather, what we find is that the United States has never expressed, it, expressed itself as an occupier. Who would? They will never admit to occupation. But yet, to admit to occupation is in a sense to admit to the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state. Hawaii's legal and political history today is, is much more complex, is much more nuanced, in part because we have a much better understanding of what took place in the 19th century. Council of Regency was started um... According to Article 33 of the Constitution of 1864, 
in similar fashion to the Belgian Council of Regency, which was established when Belgium was in exile. The Hawaiian Council of Regency was established the same way under our law. So that the Council of Regency can uh, represent a nation that is in exile at the, at the international level. And, and I look forward to their royal, uh, the Royal Commission of Inquiry. If we can accept the fact that there still is a kingdom of Hawaii and that it was never annexed, that um, there was occupation and there still is occupation, then how do we deal with that? And I was really impressed that he followed through with what he told us in the May 15th meeting with the Council of Regents, or Regency, and uh, um, created the um, re reconciliation or recognition of our current government. In my capacity as Jen Ruggles' um, lawyer, Jen is, was at the time a member of the Hawaii County Council, who had come to some realizations, troubling realizations, about her situation being a, an office holder in an occupation government that didn't recognize itself as an occupation government and was placing her at risk of committing war crimes. There was also a link to the Permanent Court of Arbitration's case repository where it, it showed a case titled Lance Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. And it was an active case on their case repository, which really proved that the Hawaiian Kingdom does continue to exist. And from what I understood, the Acting Council of Regency is what brought that case to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. That people have a hard, hard time to accept the truth. I run into this constantly. I introduce myself, then we start a discussion, then I tell them what we now know. Their eyes become large, they begin to smile incredulously, and then once you mention the court case in The Hague, things change, and they begin to take it seriously. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Suzanne Adeli. Suzanne is a lawyer and the president of the National Lawyers Guild and a member of the Bureau of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. The National Lawyers Guild is a progressive bar association of American lawyers and law practitioners. The International Association of Democratic Lawyers is a non-governmental organization that has special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, and are accredited to participate in the Human Rights Council's sessions as an observer through the National Lawyers Guild's International Committee. She has worked to use the law to expose and build accountability for U.S. imperialist policies. She'll be speaking on the current efforts of these organizations to expose the illegal occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Please join me in welcoming Susanna Deli. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, aloha, greetings to everybody. Um, I want to just give uh, special thanks to my colleague, Dr. Kiano Sai, um, for giving me the opportunity to address you all today. Um, as Dr. Moore mentioned, um, I am the president of the National Lawyers Guild and a member of the Bureau of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. The National Lawyers Guild is the oldest and largest progressive bar association in the U.S. Our members include lawyers, legal workers, jailhouse lawyers, and law students. The NLG was formed in 1937 as the U.S.'s first racially integrated bar association to advocate for the protection of constitutional human and civil rights. And as our mission states, we regard human rights and ecosystems to be more sacred than property rights. And that is reflected 
in the work that we do, which is very wide in scope. I have had the privilege of acting as the NLG's national president since 2021. Yet for many years, I have also been one of the co-chairs of the National Lawyers Guild International Committee. NLG International uses its platform to bring attention to the imperialist policies of the US government around the globe and the continuing perpetuation of injustice that comes from those policies. We engage in international law and international legal mechanisms to expose these violations of human rights by the US government and corporate entities. In 2019, at our annual convention in North Carolina, NLG International, with the help of Dr. Tsai, officially established the NLG Hawaiian Subcommittee and committed itself to supporting the work of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. It was an easy decision. Keanu and his colleagues, including Steve, laid out for us a clear and simple legal analysis that the Kingdom of Hawaii was under military occupation. The law and the historical record was clear, yet it never occurred to us prior to meeting our Hawaiian colleagues to look at Hawaii through that framework. As a result of the work of the Hawaiian Subcommittee in 2020, the NLG national membership, national membership passed a national resolution committing the NLG to working in support of this movement and calling upon the United States to immediately begin to comply with international humanitarian law in its prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom since, 19, since 1893. The resolution also stated that the occupation of Hawaii is the longest running belligerent occupation of a foreign country in the history of international relations and the United States has been in violation of international law in this capacity for over a century. It went further to say, the NLG also condemns the unlawful presence and maintenance of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command with its 118 military sites throughout the Hawaiian Islands, which has caused the islands to be a target for nuclear strike. The NLG also stated that it calls for the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law and begin to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom as the occupied state. It called upon the legal and human rights community to view the U.S. presence in the Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands through the prism of international law and to roundly condemn it as an illegal occupation. It clearly stated a support for the Hawaiian Council of Regency who represented the Hawaiian Kingdom at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in its efforts to seek resolution in accordance with international law as well as its strategy to have the state of Hawaii and its counties comply with international humanitarian law as the administration of the occupying state. And it called upon the UN member states and non-member states to not recognize as lawful a situation created by a serious violation of international law such as this, and to not render aid or assistance in maintaining the unlawful situation. As an, internationally, um, as an internationally wrongful act, all states shall cooperate to ensure the United States complies with international humanitarian law and consequently bring an end to the unlawful occupation of the Hawaiian Islands. The language of this resolution was also adopted by the International Association of Lawyers in 2021. The IDL is an international organization of human rights lawyers and jurists founded it in 1946 with member associations and individual members in over 90 countries around the globe. The IDL is dedicated to upholding international law and promoting the tenets of the UN Charter in furtherance of peace and justice. The IDL has worked with the Council and organizations like the American Association of Jurists to bring this analysis to UN colleagues around the globe, including through the US Human Rights Council in Geneva. Additionally, the NLG, IADL, and the Water Protectors League, a US-based legal organization that defends those criminalized for protecting the natural resources of sovereign, sovereign indigenous nations, jointly filed an amicus brief supporting the Hawaiian Kingdom's complaint against the US, requesting a declaratory judgment and effective end of the US occupation. 
As this work has developed within our organization, the conversations that we've been having inside and outside the NLG often go like this. We would reiterate to them what we've learned from all of you, point out the legal and historical truth, the illegal occupation of Hawaii, and point out that the framework of the laws of occupation apply using the legal and historical accounts that have been presented um, to the world. And very often, the faces of our colleagues would go from a look of confusion to then a look of surprise and then a look of realization and recognition that this is absolutely true. But you know, <clears throat> we can't just leave it at that, right? It's, it's not just about getting that recognition of the legal facts and the historical facts. It's not just about it being an anomaly in history or an interesting piece of international legal discourse that people like to write about and talk about. It's a reminder that the U.S. is fundamentally an imperialist nation and that the U.S. invasion of Hawaii was one of its earliest imperialist projects and that the violation and the stripping of the sovereignty of the Kingdom of Hawaii has had direct material impact on the Hawaiian people especially in the context of economic and political self-determination. I actually want to quote a colleague of mine, Natalie Segovia, um, which is something that she wrote in the amicus brief. She's from the Water Protectors League. This case is about the sovereignty of the Hawaiian kingdom and the right of self-determination for an entire nation. I don't mean lukewarm self-determination within the boundaries of a settler state. I mean the self-determination that is at the heart of international law, the right of nations to self-govern, to freely determine their political status, their economic, social, and cultural development within their own territory. I'd like to end on that note and also state that the NLG and the IADL will continue to do our part in solidarity with you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. It's a great honor for me to introduce our first presenter today, Professor William Shabas. William Shabas is a professor of international law at Middlesex University in London. He is also a professor emeritus in international human rights law and human rights at Leiden University, professor emeritus of human rights law at the University of Galway, and an invited visiting scholar at the Paris School of International Affairs. Professor Shabas is recognized as a leading expert on international human rights law, international criminal law, genocide, and capital punishment. Today, Professor Shabas will be speaking on the article that he authored entitled, Legal Opinion on War Crimes Related to the United States Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom since 17th of January, 1893, which is published in volume three of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, and also in the um, Royal Commission of Inquiry book that is um, here today. Please join me in welcoming Professor William Shavis. Distinguished participants, colleagues, dear friends. I feel very honored to be invited to make this presentation to you here. I was approached, I think, four years ago, three or four years ago now, by Dr. Sai about preparing an expert opinion for the Royal Commission on the subject of war crimes. It's premised on the assumption that the, that the Hawaiian kingdom uh, remains to this day in a state of belligerent occupation by the government of the United States. And it's an attempt to examine the consequences of that occupation in terms of liability for what are called war crimes. And so I'm going to go through some of this. Please Excuse me if it sounds occasionally a bit pedantic or professorial. It's uh, my profession, and I can't really 
I can't really get through this material without a bit of that. And um, I hope that I'll make the material, which can be quite technical and legalistic, uh, accessible to all of you. Uh, and of course, we'll have a question period as well if there are aspects and issues that remain unclear for you. The body of law I'm going to talk about, we're within the general framework of what we call public international law, but it has different features and different components to it. So the first, which is, these are all related bodies of law, is the law dealing with the use of force. And we've all heard lots about that uh, in the last 11 months since the uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine began. This all relates to this issue of the prohibition of aggression and the prohibition of annexation. The second body of law that's important is what we call the law of armed conflict. Uh, earlier, there was reference to international humanitarian law. These are synonyms. They mean the same. Um, if you learn your international humanitarian law in the military, they'll call it the law of armed conflict. If you learn it in the university, we call it international humanitarian law. This is the law that governs the conduct of a war and the treatment of persons who've fallen under the control of one of the parties to the conflict. That's the part that concerns us. We're not here talking about the conduct of hostilities in the war. We're talking essentially about the treatment of peoples in an occupied territory. And that means that we don't need the presence of an armed conflict. The occupied territory results from an act of armed conflict, but the situation of occupation may continue uh, for many years after uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom being, in a way, the supreme example. But we have other modern, more modern cases, and I'll speak about them a little bit because they're relevant to the issue, and they uh, are also useful in uh, conveying to a broader public around the world the importance of the issue of occupation. I'm speaking, for example, about uh, Palestine, occupied since 1967. Northern Cyprus, occupied since 1974. Not as long as the Hawaiian Kingdom, but an awfully long time. Generations for the people of those countries. We have the example that gets all of the attention and the publicity today are the occupied portions of Ukraine, Crimea, and the Donbass. So a topical issue, one of great concern, and in many ways uh, provides an opportunity to uh, convey and to explain to people uh, about this, in a way, the oldest, as it's been said, and the most enduring situation of belligerent occupation. The third area of law, which is related, relevant to this, is human rights law. I'll say less about this because I'm really focused on the war crimes, but the war crimes are closely related to ongoing violations of human rights. And we have a body of law that has developed since the Second World War that we call international human rights law. And that, like the other bodies of law, are binding uh, on the United States of America, uh, as well as on, of course, your neighbors in all directions, countries around the world. And then finally, the field that really is my field more particularly, which we call international criminal law. International criminal law is a of the, of, 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 that applies here in uh, Hawaii. Uh, as it does elsewhere in the United States and other countries, the domestic criminal law dealing with what we tend to call ordinary crimes. And then the international crimes, which are subjects of international interest. Ordinary crimes are, in principle, the property of a sovereign state. 
and no other country really is interested in dealing with them. National crimes, on the other hand, create special obligations and elements as well in terms of prosecuting them. And so when it's a case of international crimes, we have institutions that deal with them as well. The most famous of them all today is the International Criminal Court. The most famous of them historically are the two that we call in, in colloquially the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Tokyo Tribunal after the cities where the, tri where the trials took place. The title of my report is War Crimes. I, I need to say a word of explanation about this because war crimes have, the, the term has different meanings. There's a, a technical meaning, uh, which is the one that we apply in the courts, the, the field of international criminal law. There's more of a colloquial meaning as well. When I speak, maybe later today, well, it's too late in the time zone, but tomorrow morning I'll talk to my mother in Canada and she'll ask me, you know, what were you doing? And I'll say, well, I was talking about war crimes in Hawaii. I'm not going to say to her, I was talking about war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. It's, it's enough for me to say war crimes. And I have a, a little clipping up there to give you an example of it. This is from the New York Times a few years ago. A Bosnian Serb who had been convicted by an international criminal court the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the headline in the New York Times says, Momcilo Krajnik, Bosnian Serb, convicted of war crimes, dies at 75. It's not accurate. He wasn't convicted of war crimes. He was convicted of crimes against humanity. But this is a nuance. This is being pedantic a little bit. Um, and, and it's the use of the term in the colloquial sense, the way I would use it when I'm talking with my my mother. But the report I've done for the Royal Commission is different. It's about the technical term of war crimes, which are certain specific violations of the laws and customs of war, of the law of armed conflict, of international humanitarian law. And I've mentioned here two of the classic places that we look for these war crimes. One of them are, we're, we have this, this notion of serious violations of the laws and customs of war. So not all violations of the laws and customs of war are war crimes. They're violations of the laws and customs of war. They may be addressed in some legal context, but we're looking at a narrower subset that have been identified as serious violations and therefore as war crimes. And that elevates them into this field of international criminal law. They are international crimes subject to prosecution by international tribunals, as well as by the courts of countries around the world that may have no direct interest in the place where the crime was committed, but are entitled to prosecute them under the principle we call universal jurisdiction because they are crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. And today, the prevailing definition of war crimes, where they're actually codified, set out in print as to what they are, is Article 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The Rome Statute has not been ratified by the United States of America. The statute was signed by the United States of America, which is a more of a symbolic act of, of uh, favorable disposition towards the text. This was done in the dying days of the Clinton administration at the end of the year 2000. And then it was repudiated and revoked the signature a few years later. And the United States of America has run hot and cold over the years with, in terms of its approach and attitude to the International Criminal Court, mainly depending on whether the International Criminal Court shows any interest in prosecuting crimes with which the, the United States may be associated, or crimes with which the allies and friends of the United States may be associated, 
and crimes with which enemies of the United States may be associated. And as long as the International Criminal Court goes after the enemies of the United States, it is quite friendly to the institution. And when it starts to nip at the heels of the friends of the United States or of the United States itself, it releases its venom and hostility to the organization. Something's happened to my, my screen. I think it's telling me I talk too long when I'm looking at a slide. It's a message to move on. So this slide tries to enumerate some of the sources of the law specifically when we're talking about uh, war crimes law. I should say as well, because I've referred to other areas of law, this is the, the time factor is extremely important and interesting to us because on the one hand, we need to determine the law that was in force in the 1890s for obvious reasons. But of course, we also need to determine the law that's in force today. And we also need to establish how much of this law applied to the United States of America and identify parts of the law that maybe don't apply to the United States of America because international law is a mixture of rules that apply to every country and then rules that apply particularly between different countries as a result in general of treaties that they've made on a bilateral or a multilateral basis or on customs, customary law which may be regional in nature just as it may be universal in nature. The other thing that is so important in doing this is appreciating how the law has evolved and developed. And we'll see when it comes to looking at the specific war crimes, when we study that field, there are acts that were committed in the 19th century, in the 1890s, that were not then considered to be war crimes, but that are today. Just as there are acts that were prohibited and were treated as prohibitions, maybe war crimes in the 1890s, and that seem to be accepted today. I'll give you a couple of examples. Today, we say that it's prohibited to uh, conscript, recruit, and actively use children in armed conflict. Of 15 years of age, Many countries say it should be. It's not contested that this is an international. But if we're talking about a 14-year-old, there's no doubt this is an international crime. It, it wasn't 125 years ago. It wasn't even prohibited 125 years ago. And armies had many adolescents, teenagers, who were part of their armies. So this is an example of a crime that has become an international crime since then, but wasn't in the 1890s. But to give another example of a prohibition that went in the other direction, at the end of the 1890s, at the famous Hague Conference of 1899, a treaty was adopted prohibiting the use of aerial bombing in armed conflict. Can you imagine how much happier humanity would have been if that prohibition had continued, it didn't last. And of course, today, it's an accepted fact that wars involve dropping bombs out of airplanes and drones and so on, when 125 years ago, this was actually prohibited. So this is crimes. what were the war crimes? And then finally, one other thing is that the occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom removes it from participation in the making of international law. And that's also of relevance to our conversation uh, because the law really is, is, is developing at a, at a it's, an, it's an almost a turning point, the 1890s and the beginning of the 20th century in terms of the law as it is advancing and developing. The notion of war crimes is entirely new. 
and in fact there's no basis for prosecuting war crimes until we get to the end of the First World War in 1919 and the conference in Paris, the Paris Peace Conference, where the notion of war crimes was, was developed. Prior to that, we had these important treaties, and they're referred to in our materials, the Hague Conferences of 1899 and of 1907. But the Hawaiian Kingdom, for obvious reasons, was not invited to those conferences. We were talking about it, Dr. Sai and the others, yesterday, um, and saying that had the occupation not taken place and had the annexation not taken place, probably the Hawaiian Kingdom would have been invited to the conference in The Hague in 1899 to participate in the making of international law. There was a subsequent conference. The one in 1899 was convened by the Russian emperor. The one in 1907 was convened by the American president, Theodore Roosevelt. I'm not so sure about 1899, actually, whether the Hawaiian Kingdom would have been invited even if it was not occupied. Not every country was invited. You know the term, the color line. There's a color line in international law. The term I'm not so invented, sure about 1899. I think by Frederick Douglass, and it was used famously by W.E.B. Du Bois, the African-American activist and intellectual. But there's, there still is a color line in international law frankly, but it was very profound at the beginning and in, the, in 1899 when the Hague Conference the country was invited. It was essentially confined to European states and other Christian states in the Western Hemisphere, in South, South America. But some Christian states weren't invited. Liberia in Africa was not invited and Haiti in the Western Hemisphere was not invited. So I'm not sure that they would have invited the Hawaiian Kingdom, but these things were fixed uh, in the subsequent meeting in 1907, and those countries then participated, and I suppose that the Hawaiian Kingdom would have been a part of that lawmaking process then, and it certainly if it had been in existence in, 18, so I'm not in sure. 1919, at the end of the First World War, if it had been um, a state that was active, uh, it would have been a participant in the Paris Peace Conference and would have contributed to this process of the making of international law. And those countries then... So, one of the things that happens at the Paris Peace Conference is that they have serious discussion for the first time about what war crimes consist of. Defining them, and they prepare a list of more than 30 and those countries war crimes. Then. And I haven't listed them all Fast. in the opinion I wrote. I've listed the ones that are relevant to a situation of occupation. And they were derived mainly because in the First World War, Germany had occupied parts of, had, had occupied most of Belgium and parts of northeastern France. And I wrote, I've listed the ones, and I wrote, I've listed the ones that are. Stories that are and so a series of crimes was defined. They were derived from each general agreement at the Paris Peace Conference that these were war crimes in parts of northeastern France law and subject to prosecution under international I've listed the one. This is important because it doesn't, the list was referred to at the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War. It's regarded as a valid they list were derived and an authoritative general statement of international crimes. But some of the crimes, including the ones that interest us the most, don't appear in the most recent codifications of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It doesn't mean they're not crimes. Because the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court doesn't include all international crimes. For example, it, it has a prohibition of, of, of certain weapons. It says that any weapon that causes unnecessary suffering or superfluous harm uh, is a, that its use is a crime under the Rome Statute. But then it identifies what clue. they are and it identifies dumb, dumb bullets and poison and arrows and crimes. other dangerous weapons that belong to ancient times and it doesn't mention nuclear weapons, anti-personnel mines, cluster munitions and so on. The stuff that scares us the most today. So, um, this, this list is important.
that develops following the trials at the end of the Second World War, the Nuremberg trial, and the Tokyo trial. And it's only at that point that we really develop treaties where these crimes are identified. The Geneva Convention of 1949, there are four of them. There's one that interests us. This is the fourth Geneva Convention because the fourth Geneva Convention deals largely with occupied territory and it's the gold standard. And the fourth Geneva Convention underwent some um, uh, development, uh, became more uh, detailed and sophisticated in a protocol that was adopted to the Geneva Convention in 1977. In terms of these bodies of law, the position of the United States of America, it participated in the Paris Peace Conference and there's no I think serious argument that it wasn't in agreement with the list of crimes that was developed there. American judges at Nuremberg referred to the list in their judgments in the, in the post Second World War period. The United States, of course, is a party to the Fourth Geneva Convention, but not to the additional protocol to the Fourth Geneva Convention. And finally, in the modern period, we have tribunals with which the United States is associated, although it's not subject to them, the ad hoc tribunals created for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda and then the International Criminal Court. People sometimes think because today the United States is not necessarily friendly to the International Criminal Court that it's hostile to international justice, but it loves international tribunals when it controls them. And that was the case with Nuremberg and in, in Tokyo, and more recently with Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Very great enthusiasm, great support for it, but as long as it wasn't possible for it also to be within the sights of the tribunal. I mentioned the time factor. This is important. This is, uh, we can't escape this. This is about when crimes took place, whether they were viewed as crimes. So I put up here on the screen a quotation. It's not directly relevant, I think, to the situation that, that we're considering here. This is from a document that was adopted at a great conference organized by the United Nations in 2001 on racism and racial discrimination. Virtually every country in the world participated and virtually every country in the world agreed with the declaration that was adopted at the end of the conference. Two countries boycotted the conference, Israel and the United States. And I have to tell you, because I've recently done a study of this, basically every significant attempt by the United Nations since 1945 to deal with racial discrimination, the U.S., government has found one reason or another, one pretext or another to say, we're not going, we're not part of it, we're avoiding it. And that continues to the present day. The declaration was adopted at the Durban conference, uh, nevertheless had controversies in it, and they were able to agree by what we call consensus to a text, but then states would append declarations saying they disagreed. And so, here the declaration talks about slavery and the slave trade and it says that they are a crime against humanity and should always have been so. And this is very controversial language because the countries of the Caribbean and the countries of Africa both made statements when this was adopted saying we don't agree. We don't agree that it should always have been so, it always was. And so this is important to understand because we're going to encounter similar arguments when we talk about war crimes in the 1890s and in subsequent years that at the time they should have been a war crime but weren't recognized as a war crime. It's a period that's very much a, a hinge period in the development of the law because we don't really have a recognition of war crimes uh, in a formal sense until the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. And it's important to be able to say that some of these acts and crimes were in fact uh, crimes back in the 1890s 
and in the years that, that followed. I've also used this word decolonizing. I, I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we're talking about a colonial situation. I understand that's not the, the reality. We use the term decolonizing much more generally in international law to um, refer to uh, attempts by many participants, scholars, activists, and so on, to view international law differently, not as a creation of powerful states in the global north, but countries in the global south who use international law as a battleground to advance their ideas and their positions and to deal with historic injustices. And we use this term intertemporality sometimes. And that too is a confused term, the notion of intertemporality, which was developed uh, in the context of some, a dispute between two colonizing nations from Europe who were quarreling over an island, who had the island, and what was the law that was applicable. And this was at a time when they considered the law was being made by a handful of European colonial states and the rest of the world didn't participate in it. So one of the problems is sometimes the law we want to uphold and the hypocritical states uh, who helped develop it, who participated in the process, find ways to defy or to ignore the law. And so it's important to use the ancient law and hold them to it and say, you're not, you're applying double standards, you're not respecting the law. But in certain contexts, it's also important to remind people that the law was created at a time when many parts of the world didn't participate in making international law, and there's no reason, therefore, why they should be bound by it and why they should be required to follow it. So this is kind of the paradox that we have to encounter in examining this question as well. And, and finally, an example, this is not about war crimes. This is a cartoon from the International New York Times some years ago. And of course, it deals with the Armenian genocide and the Ottoman uh, agent who's standing there herding the Armenians onto the railway cars is saying, don't worry, the word genocide doesn't exist. So I'm making this point because don't worry. The fact that war crimes were not defined by treaty in the 1890s and in the beginning of the 20th century doesn't mean they didn't exist. One final point about this, because I'm going to go and talk about some of the specific war crimes for a few minutes, is that we're, here we're, we're not talking, when we, when we debate about whether genocide was committed, the operative date for the, for the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire is 1915. There's no realistic hope that we're going to prosecute any individual for those crimes in 1915. There are no perpetrators left alive. Nevertheless, the debate about whether these were war crimes remains salient. It's extremely important because we're using this term and this notion of war crimes, of course. We would like to get people into criminal courts, charge with them, uh, and, and have, have trials and prosecutions. But there's also more of, a, there's a, more of a rhetorical use of the term, which is, is extremely important. Uh, it underscores the gravity of the, of the acts that they're treated as crimes. And so that international historic dimension is also uh, of great importance to us. This is another facet of the time factor. So I talked about intertemporality a minute ago, the idea that, that we apply the law based on the law as it was when the act in question happened rather than the law as it is today. But we also have this problem when we talk about criminal prosecution. People say you can't prosecute people retroactively. And we all understand you don't have to be a lawyer to know that principle. I saw that the lawyers for Alec Baldwin, the actor, uh, are raising that argument in court with regard to the recent um, charges that have been made against him, saying the process in the headline in the newspaper yesterday or the day before, saying the prosecutors made a mistake because the prosecutor's charging a crime that wasn't a crime when the act took place. 
That's the idea. It was raised by the defendants at Nuremberg. Uh, it was raised by the defendants at Tokyo. And it gets raised again. And it gets raised basically in any discussion where you're talking about prosecuting crimes where the acts weren't necessarily defined by a treaty or in a code, but where they were nevertheless prohibited. And the law recognizes this. Um, the Nuremberg Tribunal recognizes it. And I've cited here a case that will be familiar to most of you, I'm sure. This is from the European Court of Human Rights dealing with a retroactive prosecution of war crimes in the Second World War. And I had the honor to be the counsel to Latvia in that case before the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights where we won the argument that certain acts that were not set down in black letter law when they took place during the Second World War were nevertheless war crimes and it was entirely legitimate to prosecute them in modern times. So this is the first of our crimes that interests us usurpation of sovereignty during occupation. This crime is on the list of 1919. It's not in the modern codifications, and that means, and I mentioned this in the legal opinion, maybe I ate a little bit. I think I might just fine-tune the phrases if I was to rewrite it again, the opinion. But it's an issue that we'll have to confront in the debates. People will say, well, okay, that was 1919, but why hasn't it been continued into modern times? And there may be different explanations for that. It was certainly referred to, this crime, in 1940, in, in the aftermath of the Second World War, before the American military tribunals that sat in the Nuremberg courtroom. And this is from the trial... Some of you may know this. This is the trial on which the film, Judgment at Nuremberg, the famous film, is based. This was the trial of Nazi judges and prosecutors. And the issue arose about that crime, and the American judge referred to it in the judgment, the crime of usurpation of sovereignty. And there have been, there were discussions of it in 1919 as well. And it's... But I'll let Keanu do the, he's done this and demonstrated it in his writings as well, how the facts fit that crime. The facts of the destruction of institutions, the replacement of institutions by the occupying power. The, the legal question that's of interest here is how, uh, how to position the crime as a continuing crime or as a crime because we, we have some crimes that that start, they're committed, and then they continue. Um, the crime of apartheid is a continuing crime. We don't say that the crime of apartheid is, takes place when the legislation is adopted. The crime continues as long as that legislation is in force. And I think the same must be true of the crime of usurping sovereignty in an occupied territory. It's very clear this prohibition was discussed and taken as, a, as an important prohibition in 1919. It's referred to in 1945. And I think this is where we have to, um, where the arguments have to, be, have to be made based on the facts. So I can, I can, you know the facts. I can deliver the law to you. I think they line up. I think that this crime, and I'm, I'm anxious to see it picked up, the two cases I've mentioned here, as I say, we could add Crimea to the, to the list, but the ones that are protracted and extremely painful crimes that I've been involved in are the cases of occupation both in Cyprus and in Palestine, which are ongoing situations of intolerable um, uh, occupation. The second crime, denationalization. This too is on the list in 1919. I think that it has been, all, it's not in the modern day codifications. It was referred to in the Nuremberg trials, but it has been overtaken, I think, by two other crimes that cover much of the, the same reality, which are crimes against humanity and genocide. Genocide in its most extreme form. 
Genocide is more narrow because it requires really physical extermination of a group. Um, and the thing about denationalization is that it's much broader and it includes what we often call cultural genocide, the destruction of a culture, the destruction of the language, um, as a way of removing the group. Because you can destroy a group, a national, ethnic, racial group, you can destroy that group by other means than physical extermination if you remove all of the features of its cultural identity. And that's what that crime captures. And finally, I, I have some other crimes there on, on subsequent slides, but I think, I, I think my sell-by date has arrived. I've talked it off. Um, I'm, there, there are details there about pillage and military recruitment, and they're of secondary interest. You can read about them in the report. But I'll conclude with this one, population transfer. The transfer of a population into an occupied territory. And this is... In a way, the, the interest in this crime is that it's covered by the Geneva Conventions. It's in the Fourth Geneva Convention, the prohibition of the transfer of settlers into an occupied territory, and it's set out as an international crime in the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions adopted in 1977. So it has the strongest claim to be an international crime in the present day. And so the transfer of your population into an occupied territory is prohibited. And it's prohibited for, because of the consequences that you all know, that it transforms the demographics of the population and may ultimately lead then to the destruction of the, uh, of the reality of the territory the social and cultural reality of the territory um, in a, over time and indirectly. And we have manifestations of this uh, elsewhere in Palestine where the, the, the population of occupied Palestine has been transformed by settlers moving into Palestine and to some extent in northern Cyprus, although northern Cyprus is different because it involved the expulsion of the Greek-speaking uh, indigenous population of northern Cyprus. So these three crimes, these three core crimes, the usurpation of sovereignty, uh, the, um, the transfer of populations, and denationalization are all real crimes, crimes where there are good arguments, strong arguments for their international dimension as crimes under international law, and where the definitions um, uh, find very clear application, I think, here in the occupied uh, Hawaiian kingdom. Thank you for your attention. Mahalo, Professor Shabis. Uh, remember uh, to hold your questions for our question panel um, after our break for drinks and poo-poos. Um, our second presenter today is Professor Federico Lanzarini. Federico Lanzarini is a professor of international law, European Union law, and international human rights law at the Department of Political and International Science at the University of Siena in Italy. He is also a professor at the Master of Laws program in Intercultural Human Rights on the African System of Human Rights at St. Thomas University School of Law in Miami, Florida. He has been a visiting professor in several foreign universities and provided over 120 lectures in more than 20 countries. Professor Lanzarini is the deputy head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. He will be presenting today on his article entitled Legal Opinion on the Authority of the Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom, published in Volume 3 of the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, and also in the volume that you received today. Join me in wel welcoming Professor Federico Lanzarini. Good 
Mahalo. Um, you pronounce my name much better than most Italians do. <laughs> uh, mahalo in particular to Ken Sai. Uh, now he's a good friend of mine, of course, for organizing this event. It's a real honor for me to be here. And uh, it is an honor under many points of view. For instance, it is an honor to be associated to Professor Shebas. I mean, he's a uh, one of the most important authorities in international law. And in comparison to him, I am a student, so being in the same position in this event is really great for me. And uh, before starting with my presentation, I have to say that I'm too close to the microphone. I have to say that well, I was here already in 2017, six, uh, six years ago, and it's a long way from Italy to get to Hawaii. Uh, Keanu knows that for Italians, Hawaii are a real myth, no? When we think about changing our life, and we think about going to Hawaii. And when I was here in 2017, I mean, I was here with my family, uh, only my uh, oldest child was born. Now I'm here with three children, in addition to my wife. The youngest one is two months today, and he put his feet for the first time in the sea in Hawaii. Um, and thank you, Mahalo. And this morning, I mean, again, I repeat, it's a long way, but this morning when I, I, I saw many familiar faces again after six years. And it was about that no time had passed from last time. So um, it is like going back home in a way, uh, coming here. This is the reason why I am very much uh, honored and I have also uh, some sort of emotion in being here today. Uh, my relationship with the Hawaiian kingdom at first was supposed to be only a professional relation. Now it is much more. And also under a professional point of view, I have to say that uh, has been something very new for myself. I have been learning a lot in starting this exercise. Uh, in Italy, uh, when it comes to international law, uh, we have an idea of the law of occupation, which is very, uh, I would say, not dynamic. And I would say static in the sense that all Italian professors think that everything which happened before World War II cannot be put into discussion today. Irrespective of the events, of the circumstances, irrespective of the reasons which led a country to occupy another state, another independent state. And I have to confess that before meeting uh, Professor Kianosai, I could not imagine what the real situation of Hawaii was. And in these years, I have learned a lot, thanks to this involvement in, in your case. And so basically, uh, today I have the possibility to say something, having reconsidered my knowledge and my uh, learning of international law in light of the situation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So basically, the, the purpose of my presentation is to assess the issue of the authority of the Council of Regency as a government of an occupied state. In addition, I had to assess also the authority of the Royal Commission of Enquiry, uh, which is the main topic of the uh, study that I have published in your review. And you know that the Royal Commission of Enquiry was established by the Council of Regency by proclamation in 2019. But before doing that, it is necessary to carry out a preliminary investigation concerning the basic question of the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom, which is exactly uh, the, the, the key element 
of all our discussions. So let us start with this issue of the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom because uh, it is the pre preliminary aspect to be considered uh, as a precondition even for imagining the possibility that uh, there can be a legitimacy in the Council of Regency and the Royal Commission of Enquiry. So, um, the first question is whether the Hawaiian Kingdom can be considered today a state under international law, which is a very controversial question. As I previously told you, uh, the answer to the, this question under the uh, traditional approach which characterizes the school of international law in the context of which I was formed would be negative. So it is certainly challenging um, under different points of view. And in view of providing an answer to the first question, it is also necessary to uh, provide an answer to other two preliminary questions. The first one is whether the state at the time when it was militarily occupied by the United States in 1893, and then if the answer to this question uh, can be considered positive, we had to assess whether the continuous occupation of Hawaii by the United States for 1893 to present times has led the Hawaiian Kingdom to be extinguished as an independent state. So, in other words, whether the Hawaiian Kingdom has ceased to be a state under international law as a consequence of the long-lasting American occupation. So as regards the uh, issue whether the Hawaiian Kingdom was a state at the time when it was occupied by the United States of America, I think that we don't need to spend much time on this issue because it was crystal clear that the Hawaiian Kingdom was an independent state at the time for a number of reasons. Um, uh, this was recognized in the Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom case before the Permanent Court of Arbitration that the Hawaiian Kingdom uh, entertained many uh, relations with other states and has existed as an independent state. And also, under the theoretical point of view, it is quite clear that the Kingdom fully satisfied the four elements of statehood uh, that were considered at the time as essential in order to be an independent country, which were later codified by the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States in 1933. Uh, that was a convention codifying pre-existing customary international law, which was already in force at the end of the 19th century. These elements are a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and a capacity to enter into relations with the other states. Uh, as regards the uh, latter aspect that I have cited, the Hawaiian Kingdom was a member of the Universal Postal Union since 1882. We, we have discussed this issue with both Professor Shebes and Keanu uh, while we met at breakfast yesterday and this morning. And uh, he had entered into extensive diplomatic and treaty relations with a number of states here you can find the list, probably the most important actors of the international community at the relevant time. And uh, in light of what I have just said, the question to the first answer is certainly positive. In the 1890s, the Hawaiian Kingdom was a state and consequently a subject of international law. And this implied that it's Territorial sovereignty and its internal affairs could not be violated by other states under the rules in force at the relevant time in international law. So we have satisfied the first uh, condition. It is essential to, uh, to go forward with my presentation. The second question is whether 
The continuous occupation of Hawaii by the United States starting in 1893 has led the Hawaiian Kingdom to be extinguished as a state and as a subject of international law. And of course, the answer to this question is more controversial than the previous one, because uh, you, you can imagine what is my position, of course, and I'm going to express it right now. But we had to recognize that uh, several scholars in international law have a different idea. And I have experienced this, especially in my own country. So it was not so good for me, because uh, each time that I raise this issue at a conference, uh, my Italian colleagues always give the same answer that I previously told you. No, what happened before World War II cannot be discussed any longer. It's now crystallized, and so international law has to respect all these situations. Probably were discussed it this morning. The reason of this answer is not really because they think that the Hawaiian Kingdom is not a state, but because first they don't know the reality about the Hawaiian Kingdom. And I had to confess that the same was for me before meeting Keanu. Uh, and second, uh, the situation of the Hawaiian Kingdom is so unique that probably many scholars have never been considered how it should be settled under a legal point of view. In any event, uh, we can say that uh, many, many arguments could be raised in order to support one idea or another, and of course we don't have time um, at this point to, to, to list and to extensively discuss all these arguments. Um, here I have taken an excerpt from the, uh, from the decades of the large numbers of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so we would need to consider uh, a lot of elements in order to provide an answer to this question. But in any event, in my opinion, there is an argument which supersedes, which overcomes all the others. The fact that uh, a rule of customary international law, uh, long-lasting rule of customary international law exists according to which military occupation, irrespective of its temporal extension, cannot produce the effect of extinguishing the sovereignty and statehood of the occupied state. And uh, now I have to say something uh, that has already been anticipated by Professor Shebas is the issue of inter intertemporality, you know, which is decisive in this discussion as well. Um, this rule of courts exists today and it is universally recognized. What is important for us is whether or not it already existed at the time of the American occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And uh, this is exactly the issue of intertemporal inter law to which Professor Shebas referred in his presentation. I pushed the wrong button. So how can we demonstrate that uh, this prohibition of uh, taking the sovereignty of a state through military occupation already existed at the time when the Hawaiian Kingdom was occupied by the United States in 1893. We had to see to the relevant practice existing at the time. And already well before the American occupation of the Hawaiian territory, at the Congress of, the, of Vienna, which as you know, uh, in a way transformed the system of international relations after the uh, defeat of Napoleon, and especially, of course, in Europe, uh, the um, delegations participating in the Congress endorsed the principle according to which when there was an instance of military occupation, the original sovereign of the territory maintained, retained its sovereignty. This sovereignty could not be overthrown by the occupying forts, and by effect of this rule, all the uh, states that had been occupied by Napoleon 
were considered as having retained their sovereignty. So the military occupation, even though uh, gave rise to an effective exercise of sovereignty by the occupying power over the territory, was not considered sufficient to uh, move the original government from its sovereign powers. And uh, I have mentioned the principle of effectiveness because uh, this is probably uh, the most important argument which is used by uh, those scholars that I was mentioning earlier to refute the idea that I'm trying to support in this presentation. Uh, again, I come from a school uh, in Italy uh, when we study international law at the university, normally we all study the same book in all Italian university, uh, universities by a well-known Italian scholar known Benedetto Conforti. And according to him, sovereignty is determined by effectiveness. When there is an effective exercise of the government, there is sovereignty. Then, of course, there are some problems in this position uh, with all due respect, because I'm talking about the legend of international law, and I'm just one of his students, of course. But with all due, due respect, uh, there are some problems in this position because uh, at the same time, yes, effectiveness is the rule, but there are many exceptions because international practice demonstrates that in many instances, effectiveness is not enough to give rise to sovereignty especially in time of military occupation. So, uh, going back to the, the Congress of Vienna, uh, the substance was that foreign occupation was considered illegitimate and the occupying power could not acquire legal sovereignty, the Euro sovereignty, uh, sovereignty by law. Here we have an excerpt in the original language, which is in, in French, uh, from the Affaire de la Dette Publique Ottoman, 1925, and uh, it is the, uh, a decision taken by the Swiss arbitrator Eugene Borel, 1925. This arbitrator reiterated that when there is a military occupation of the territory, in any event, this occupation cannot determine the acquisition of sovereignty by the occupying state. And, of course, this arbitrator based his position on existing international law, on international law which was in force at the time. Okay, well before, no, well, not well before, but he referred that the judgment was subsequent to the uh, American occupation of Hawaii but he referred to a body of international law which existed well before the end of the 18th century. Of course, my, my presentation uh, does not have the, the pretext of being exhaustive. I'm just reporting some examples. Uh, here we have a uh, more or less at the, the same time, 1928, this time is Judge Huber, and is the famous, for, of course, for the experts in the field, the famous Island of Palmas arbitration. And according to this judge as well, belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the state. Uh, the government authorities may be driven into exile or silence, and the exercise of the powers of the state thereby affected. But it is settled that the powers themselves continue to exist. And it appears clear, even though it is not explicitly mentioned in this excerpt, that the temporal element is not decisive in this respect. And then this is quite paradoxical, in my opinion, because this is a doctrine which, uh, which is often connected to the principle of uh, ex injuria uh, use non oritur, which means that it is not uh, legitimate to create law from violations. Violations cannot be the source of law. Uh, it's a famous doctrine elaborated in 1932 by the U.S. Secretary of State, 
Henry, uh, Henry Stimson. This is the reason why it is called the Stimson Doctrine. And uh, the United States took a position about uh, the situation that at the time was ongoing between Japan and China. And it was possible that some parts of the territory uh, of China could be taken by Japan, that uh, Japan could establish its sovereignty on some territories of China, either by agreement or through military occupation. And the U.S. Secretary of State assert that his government would never recognize any territorial change determined in this particular context. So uh, his position was clear on the fact that military occupation could not determine any change in the sovereignty of a territory of a state. And it is paradoxical that this doctrine was elaborated more or less in between uh, the occupation of Hawaii by the United States and the time when Hawaii was officially considered as a state of the U.S. Federation. So we can, we can see that objectively there is a lack of uh, coherence in the behavior of this government no, towards the situation of military occupation. Okay, and then uh, we have also uh, an excerpt on, from one of the decisions taken by the, the military tribunal at Nuremberg in 1948, previously mentioned, of course, by Professor Shebes, according to which in belligerent occupation, the occupying power does not hold enemy territory by virtue of any legal right. On the contrary, it merely exercises a precarious and temporary actual control. I reiterate, because this is the important aspect in my opinion, that all these positions taken uh, by uh, important authorities in the context of international law were based on a law which was pre-existing the occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom by the United States of America. And then we come to, the, to some of the, the most important scholars, uh, contemporary scholars in international law. Again, you know, uh, sometimes when you are a professor, or a university professor, your students tend to think that you know everything about what you're teaching them. This is not true. <laughs> we have to learn day after day, for instance, uh, I was mentioning the fact of being honored to be together with uh, Professor Shabas, and uh, this is confirmed by the fact that we had two occasions of being together for half an hour at breakfast yesterday and today, and I, I don't know how many things I learned from him in, in about one hour. Um, and so we continue to learn day after day and day after day, and when I uh, start, uh, started after meeting Keanu to try to deepen my knowledge on this issue of military occupation in international law, I was somehow surprised by the fact that uh, especially scholars uh, of Anglo-Saxon origin had a totally different position from the one that I was used to hear in my school of international law which had been presented to me as the only possible solution. On the contrary, you see that, uh, of course, these names are very well known among the experts of international law. I'm talking about real authorities, uh, James Crawford, Jan Brownlee, Joran Dinstein, uh, but these are just examples. And they state uh, what I'm trying to, to further today. The is that there cannot be acquisition of sovereignty by an occupying country through military occupation. And this is a rule which still exists today, 
but was already valid. I apologize for repeating this argument many times, but it is central in our discussion. Uh, it is a rule which has uh, not been affected by the passing of time. Just like the fact that military occupation cannot give rise to the acquisition of sovereignty by the occupying power is not affected by the passing of time. Because there are also some, mm, some scholars of saying that, okay, we can assert that the occupied state retains its sovereignty on the condition that this sovereignty does not last too much in time. Because then when uh, it is prolonged in time, we can presume that it is accepted by the international community. And so this acceptance turns the effective situation into law. Now, this cannot be, uh, cannot be supported. The, the, the length, the extension in time of the military occupation has absolutely no significance in this respect. And going back to the arbitration in the Affaire de la Dette Publique Ottoman in 1925, uh, the judge also made it clear that there is only one way to make it possible the sovereignty is transferred from the occupied to the occupying country, which is a treaty under international law. It's a treaty which must be valid and so the occupied country must enter into this treaty uh, without being forced to do that, so voluntarily. There must be an expression of consent by both parties to the extent that this content, con, uh, consent gives rise to the transfer of sovereignty from a state to another. And again, this is uh, reiterated by scholars as well. Oppenheim is another very uh, renowned scholar of international law. He's the author of one of the historically most important textbooks of international law, and he takes, took, took this position. And uh, we have also to refute another te uh, theory according to which, hypothetically, a transfer of sovereignty would be possible by pres uh, prescription on the condition that there is a question by the occupied authorities or people. It, it's uh, something very similar to, how can I say, I inverse possession in private law, no? which with the passing of time gives rise to the transfer of property. But even leaving aside that, of course, this idea is very controversial and could be discussed under several aspects, in any event, it is not of interest for us because the Hawaiian Kingdom or its people had never agreed to the occupation of the United States. And they had never accepted the, the the transfer, the cession of sovereignty over the islands to the United States. <clears throat> and this is what I anticipated previously, no? that there cannot be transfer of sovereignty even when the military occupation lasts for a long time. History learns that the United States has taken possession of the territory of Hawaii through de facto occupation only, through effectual occupation only, and unilateral annexation without concluding any treaty with the Hawaiian Kingdom and without any questions by the Hawaiian people. Uh, this is another uh, techn technical issue and probably uh, Keanu can explain this issue better than me, is a reference to the theory of a stoppel, the rule of a stoppel, uh, by virtue of which, under international law, legitimate expectation of states induced by the conduct of another state are protected. Uh, you know, um, 
I am sure better than me, then immediately after the American occupation, there was uh, a, 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 an agreement between uh, Queen Lily Wokalani and President Cleveland, U.S. President Cleveland, in which the U.S. President took a commitment to return the, the, the sovereignty of the Hawaiian Islands to the Queen. And so this created an expectation in the Hawaiian people that then was not respected by the U.S. because in, in reality this treaty was never put into, into effect because it was not backed by the, the Congress. And on the contrary, the United States decided to, to proceed to the annexation of the Hawaiian territory. So this is another reason supporting the idea that no transfer of sovereignty has occurred from the Hawaiian Kingdom to the United States. So, we're finally come to the conclusion regarding the first issue, eh? very long. Uh, we can conclude that the Hawaiian Kingdom cannot be considered as distinguished as an independent state and as a subject of international law, uh, despite the long and continuous occupation by the United States of America. Uh, because uh, there is this rule of international law according to which illegal occupation cannot of itself terminate statehood. This is the principle to, uh, to which I was referring earlier. Uh, ex injuria use non oritur. I am Italian, so I am probably my, uh, my spelling of Latin is different from yours. But... Uh, I can say that since the Latin language originated in Italy, my pronunciation is the right one. <laughs> no, that, um, of course, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm, I'm discussing all the time with uh, a, a, a German colleague of mine. He, he, origin, he is from Germany, but he teaches in the United States since a long time. And uh, when we discuss about uh, the, 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 the pronunciation of certain Latin words, for instance, use cogens or use cogens. No? In Italy, uh, we tend to say use cogens, which means peremptory international law, imperative international law. In, the, in English, uh, we used to say, and we discuss, and I say, I am Italian, so I know very well how Latin is to be pronounced, and he says, Oh yes, you are Italian, but I am German, and we know that the most renowned experts in the study of Latin language are from German. So I am right. <laughs> and we never come to an agreement on this point. But anyway, I was just explaining why my, my pronunciation of Latin can be different from the one to which I used, because we, uh, we study Latin at the high school in Italy, and so we have this tendency to pronounce it in the Italian way. And uh, the following uh, conclusion is that uh, the, the, it is not a conclusion, it is a confirmation of the conclusion that the possession of the attribute of statehood by the Hawaiian Kingdom was in substance confirmed by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Larson's versus the Hawaiian Kingdom because, as Keanu will explain better than me, um, in order for uh, a case to be admitted before the Permanent Court of Arbitration, you need to have at least one party, which is a state, unless it is an international organization. In the case of Larsen, there was a state against a private person. The private person was Larsen. The Hawaiian Kingdom was the state. Then the tribunal did not take a position on this issue because uh, for the reasons that we know very well, for the rule of the indispensable third party, so did not take a position of the, on the substance of the case. But, of course, the acceptance of the fact that the Hawaiian Kingdom is a state was necessary in order to start the case itself, to admit the case in front of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Okay, I have to hurry up, I think. Okay, so uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom is a state under international law, and this is my conclusion today. Yes.
Yes, this point is important because um, this rule is a further confirmation. Professor Shabas mentioned the, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. And there is a further confirmation of this position that military occupation cannot give rise to the transfer of sovereignty from a, uh, the occupied territory to the occupying government was codified in uh, Article 42 of the regulations annexed to the Hague Convention for respecting the laws and customs of war on land of 1907. And uh, this was a convention codifying pre-existing customary international law. So again, it is a confirmation of the fact that already at the time of the American occupation of Hawaii, uh, it is not possible to acquire sovereignty of a territory through military occupation only. And it was necessary to have a treaty. Okay, uh, let's move to the, to the following issue. The authority of the Council of Regency as a government of an occupied state. A regency is the man or body or body of men entrusted with the vicarious government of a kingdom during the minority absence, insanity, or other disability of the king. Uh, of course, this list is not, uh, does not cover all the possible situations in which it is, poss it is necessary to have a regency. Uh, the, when it comes to the situation of the Hawaiian kingdom, a regency is certainly the right body entitled to provisionally exercise the powers of the Hawaiian executive monarch in the absence of the latter, of the monarch itself, himself or herself. And this is an absence which forcibly continues today due to the persistent situation of occupation to which the Hawaiian kingdom is subjected by the United States of America. In legal terms, the legitimacy of the Hawaiian Council of Regency is grounded on Articles 32 and 33 of the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution of 1864. Uh, you have here the text of Article 32. Whenever upon the decease of the reigning sovereign, the heir shall be less than 18 years of age, the, ro the royal power shall be exercised by Regent Council of Regency, as here and after provided. And then we have the, the text of Article 33 as well, which confirms the legitimacy of the establishment of a regency to replace the, the, mon the, the, the monarch, the legitimate monarch. So uh, the Council of Regency was established by proclamation in 1997 because there was the uh, the offices uh, were vacant in the Cabinet Council on the basis of the doctrine of necessity, the application of which was justified by the, by the absence of the, king, of the king or the queen. So in the end, the Council of Regency possessed the constitutional authority to temporarily exercise the royal powers of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And this authority also exists under international law because uh, the, the Council of Regency uh, can be considered as serving as the provisional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, and this is similar to the example of Belgium which was referred to before this presentation. No? And should the military occupation come to an end, then the, the, the Council of Regency of course will convene the uh, Legislative Assembly and uh, the Legislative Assembly will proceed to choose the King or the Queen, the Monarch of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, so basically the Council of Regency holds under both domestic and international law the authority to represent the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state. Uh, this conclusion is quite plain and the reason why I'm devoting less time to, to this issue is exactly before it's not as controversial as it was the previous one. Uh, on the contrary, we need to devote uh, a little bit more attention 
to the position concerning the Royal Commission of Enquiry. Um, uh, here again, you have the conclusion according to which the Council of Regency is legitimate under international law and is in the same position of a government of a state under military occupation. It's vested with the rights and powers recognized to governments of occupied states pursuant to uh, international humanitarian law. So, among these powers, in, uh, in a way that is, of course, consistent with the powers exercised by the occupying government, the Council of Regency has the um, power to legislate, to defend the interest of the population of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So, to some extent, the Council of Regency may interact with the exercise of authority by the occupying powers. And this is a principle which is well recognized under international humanitarian law, that there should be in principle a cooperation between the two powers. And the, the government representing the occupied population can continue to legislate when this is necessary in order to protect the interest of the occupation itself. And of course, when uh, this does not create a conflict with the exercise of the power by the occupying forces. And we can say that uh, when it comes to the proclamation of the uh, Royal Com uh, Commission of Enquiry, there is absolutely, let me find the relevant slide, okay. There is no absolutely conflict with the exercise of the powers by the occupying power, the United States. The Royal Commission of Enquiry was established by proclamation in 2019. In a similar fashion to the United States proposal of establishing a commission of enquiry after the end of First World War, to consider generally the culpability of the authors of the war and so on. So you see that uh, what has been done here in the Hawaiian Kingdom reflects a practice that was already followed by the, the United States themselves. Um, and uh, again, this is my final point, we need to ascertain whether the establishment of the Royal Commission of Enquiry can be considered legitimate under international law. And the answer to this question is certainly positive because uh, as we may read in the proclamation establishing the, the, the commission, its purpose shall be to investigate the consequences of the United States belligerent occupation, including with regard to international law, humanitarian law and human rights, and the allegations of war crimes committed in that context. Uh, the concept of the Royal Commission of Enquiry is therefore to ascertain whether violations on human rights and international humanitarian law have been committed to the prejudice of the Hawaiian population and also to other people being in Hawaii, uh, not necessarily Hawaiian citizens during the, 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 during the occupation itself uh, as a consequence of the military occupation. And uh, as I was saying earlier, the proclamation of the uh, commission, of, uh, commission of Enquiry and also the uh, carrying out of the role of the Commission of Enquiry in, in, in itself do in no way undermine the rights and interests of the civilian population. On the contrary, this commission has the purpose to protect the rights and interests of the civilian population. So this is perfectly consistent with the law of occupation because it, it does not create any conflict with the exercise of authority by the United States as the, um, the occupying power. And on the contrary, it has the purpose to further the interest of the people reside, residing in the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, for the damages that they have suffered as a con consequence of the occupation. And so this, um, 
This situation, these dynamics, is to be considered in the context of the relation between the occupying and the occupied power, in the sense that the, the proclamation of the Royal Commission of Enquiry and the exercise by the Commission uh, of its competencies uh, does not undermine or significantly interfere with the exercise of the authority of the occupying power and is consistent with the international obligations in the field. So not only the United States is not pre prejudiced by the presence of the Commission and by the exercise by the Commission of its powers, but to some extent it should recognize the outcome of the exercise of the, these competencies because they have exactly the purpose of protecting the interest of the population with respect to which the United States has an obligation under international law to protect their rights and interests. So, in conclusion, the uh, Occupying power cannot be considered absolutely prevented from recognizing the legitimacy and from applying eventually the proclamation of the Council of Regency established in the Royal Commission of Enquiry as a piece of domestic legislation protecting the human rights of the local population and therefore has a duty to do that in the context of that duty of cooperating with the representative of the occupied people in order to protect the interest of the, uh, of the population living in the Hawaiian Islands. So in conclusion, the Royal Commission of Enquiry is legal under international law and has to play a role which in the future can also, um, can also produce important outcomes should the occupation come to an end because the decision taken by the, the, the Commission and all the outcomes of its activity could be applied to the Hawaiian Kingdom following the end of the American occupation. And for this reason, the, I repeat that the United States of America not only should recognize the activity of the Royal Commission of Enquiry, but should also cooperate in making possible the application of the outcomes of this activity. Thank you very much. Um, we you are much taller than me. Uh, Mahalo, professors. Um, we are a little bit over time. We're going to just ex extend everything about 10 minutes on the back end of our um, of our program today. Uh, at this time, we're taking a break for jumps and poo outside of the auditorium, and we'll start back here at um, 1:40 for our third presenter today, Dr. Keanu Sai.